Hi everyone, welcome to Five Quote Shakespeare Twelfth Night. Today we're going to look at Act 3, Scene 4, a hilarious scene that's packed with significance, so stay tuned. What I do in this series is I first give you a nutshell overview of the important plot events of each scene, and there are a lot of them in this scene, and then we dive deeply into the text of each scene, and I pull out five or more quotes that I think you'll find useful to help you understand the play's character, theme, and plot. If you find these videos useful, please like and subscribe, and if you make a donation, you'll get a complete set of the PDFs I use in this series. See the description for details. There are a lot of moving parts in this scene, so I've broken it down into four parts to help us better understand it. It opens with the yellow stocking scene, absolutely hilarious. It's where Malvolio makes a fool of himself in front of uh, Olivia. Uh, following that, we have the great Malvolio bear baiting scene. That's where Mariah, Sir Toby, and Fabian uh, 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 pretend to think that Malvolio is possessed by the devil. Uh, right after that, there's this weird little interlude where we have another short declaration of love scene uh, by Olivia to Viola. And I think that's more or less just a plot reminder uh, to keep all of the parts moving together uh, in a well-oiled way. Uh, and the la it ends with uh, Andrew and Viola, the big fight scene. It's absolutely hilarious. And th there's an introduction of a really, really important uh, uh, symbol, the purse, that I'm going to talk about today. So that involves Viola Sertoni. Toby, Fabian, Sir Andrew, and then later on Antonio comes in and the plot really kicks into gear. Okay, let's have a look at part one. The scene opens with Olivia eagerly awaiting her love interest, Viola Cesario, but before that can happen, Malvolio enters, ostentatiously displaying the seven commands laid out in Mariah's letter. Go back and look at my video, uh, Act 2, Scene 5. And of course, he's smiling and cross guarded so much so that Olivia, of course, thinks that he's absolutely crazy. She actually is convinced that he's mentally ill, and she asks the wrong people to help him. She asks Mariah and Toby to take care of him. Then she exits. Then, before, uh, before Toby and Mariah have a chance to enter, uh, Malvolio's alone on the stage, and he gives his uh, soliloquy. And, of course, it's all filled with self-deception. So alone, Malvolio interprets Olivia's calling for Toby as part of her plan, her desire to see Malvolio treat Toby badly as the letter directed. So he's reading, again, we're going to talk about the character development here and the themes of we see what we expect to see, and that's exactly what he sees. So self-deceived, he is convinced his hopes are about to be fulfilled, and the tension is rising. Okay, so quickly, part two. Malvolio finishes his reverie of expectation, and Mariah enters with Sir Toby and Fabian, and together they th the three bait Malvolio, egging him on to greater and greater folly. So again, go back and watch 2.5. Uh, it's really, really hilarious. You, you should watch this version. This is from the 2012-2013 version. I strongly recommend it. Hilarious. Feigning concern, they conclude that Malvolio is actually possessed by the devil and must be locked up in a dark room. So in the next couple of scenes, we see how we actually see that play out. They do lock him up. Uh, the imagery, imagery of the devil here becomes important. I'm going to talk about it symbolically, not just in relationship to uh, um, Malvolio, but also to Mariah and Toby as well. Arrogant to the end, of course, Malvolio exits the stage. I am not of your element. Be off, be off, he says. And then Sir Toby is left to be mightily impressed with his little devil, Mariah. So Andrew then hilariously enters, and he, 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 he shows off his challenge letter to Viola Cesario, and everyone tries not to laugh as they read the illiterate, incoherent letter. That's connected with some of the major themes as well, so we're going to talk about that today. So Toby tells Andrew to go off and seek Viola in the orchard and swear at him when you meet him, and this will demonstrate your manhood to Olivia, and you will gain her heart. So he, of course, trots off to do as he's told. He exits. Toby says that he will write a new letter because this one is absolute garbage and, and, and with a more serious challenge that will actually start some sparks on stage that are hilarious. And then Toby, Fabian, and Mariah exit. And then there's a short, short love scene. Olivia re-enters with Viola and she gives him a locket with her picture in it as a token of love. She's still insistent. She's still living in her delusions. Viola insists that Olivia should love Orsino and not her, but of course refusing to listen, Olivia insists that Viola come again tomorrow and then she exits. And then we get to part four. Now alone and somewhat confused and frustrated after receiving the love token from Olivia, now Viola has to deal with Sir Toby and Fabian who present Sir Andrew's challenge to her. She insists it's some kind of mistake because she doesn't even know this Andrew guy. But Toby and Fabian talk up Andrew's ferocity, deadly fighting skills, and determination to be revenged for the grave insult that, of course, she never made. She is confused and afraid. 
of course. So this is how it plays out. The whole stage is divided into uh, viola on this side, afraid uh, of this guy and this guy on this side, afraid of viola, do you see? So on the other side of the stage, Toby talks to Andrew, warning Andrew about viola's courage and deadly fighting skills. Remember, he's a coward, so he doesn't want to he doesn't want to take part in this at all either. So Andrew displays his cowardice and refuses to follow through with his challenge, and he offers a horse to settle the matter. Now, the horse is hilarious, but it's also deeply significant. It becomes another important symbol together with the purse, and we're going to talk about that today. So a comic back and forth, back and forth, leads to a comic drawing of swords very, very reluctantly, and they are pushed into battle by these two. Then and just as things are getting hilarious, there's lots of screeching and running around. And Antonio enters thinking that Viola is Sebastian. And he wants to defend Sebastian because he's a good buddy of Sebastian, as, as we've already seen. And he draws his sword to defend who he thinks is Sebastian against this guy who he thinks is a threat to Viola Sebastian. Officers then arrive. Do you see the chaos? It's a very chaotic scene. Very, very funny scene. So officers arrive. And if you'll remember, he was he was wanted in this town, kind of. He had bad dealings in this town a while back. And so he had to stay undercover for a while. But now he's broken cover for the sake of protecting Sebastian, who's not Sebastian. And so the officers arrive and they arrest him. Now, Antonio now needs the purse. And again, this is this important symbol that we're going to talk about today. He needs the purse now for bail so that he, and or taking care of his uh, uh, food and stuff while he's in jail. Confused, of course, she doesn't know anything about the purse because she doesn't have it because she's not Sebastian. So confused, Viola gives Sebastian what little money she can. And that act actually is significant too. We'll talk about that today. As the officers take so take Antonio away. Antonio accuses Viola Sebastian of ingratitude and betrayal. Major, major theme element, which we're going to get into today. And another major theme and character element is Toby's response to this. This cynic Toby mocks the noble speech by Antonio. And that's, that's, really, that's really important, I think, for Shakespeare. I think that's Shakespeare's voice. So we're going to talk about that too. Hearing the name Sebastian, Viola hopes her brother is still alive and Antonio has mistaken her for him. And then she exits. And that's, of course, exactly what's going, that's exactly what's going on. So Toby tells Andrew to go after, to run after Viola and assault her. Again, he's trying to prove, they're trying to convince Andrew to prove his bravery uh, in the eyes of, of Olivia. And hearing, and hearing Antonio's accusations and seeing Viola's less than manly behavior when confronted with the whole situation that we just talked about, Andrew is convinced that Viola Sebastian is a coward. So, of course, he gets his, his own lack of courage riled up and he agrees to go through with the challenge. And now we'll talk a little bit about dramatic form and then get into the text. As we have just seen in that chaotic scene, all of the plots, all of the characters are on stage, all of the plots are in full bloom. The main plots and the subplots come full convergence, and that increases the pace, as we've seen, increases the excitement as both plots rush towards their climaxes, and that's that's where we're headed, and they will be they will be resolved soon. Uh, another plot device that, that, that happens here is that uh, Chekhov's gun goes off. Now, if you remember my previous video when I talked about the, uh, the purse as Chekhov's gun, and now Anton Chekhov was a Russian writer, and he said famously, he said, if in the first act you have hung a pistol on the wall and the audience can see it, then in the following act it should be fired. Otherwise, don't put it there. So you set up some kind of expectation, and the audience is waiting for it, and you have to satisfy that expectation. Uh, so that's exactly what happens here. We were introduced to the purse previously, and it's like, wonder why, why did Antonio give, you know, give um, uh, Sebastian his purse? It doesn't really make all that much sense, but now it reemerges. It reemerges as a symbol of trust, and as a complication, and as a test of worthiness. And we see who passes and who fails. Uh, and it contrasts sharply with the horse symbol that we're going to talk about today, the horse as unworthiness. Uh, another thing to consider is uh, what we considered in the, in the previous uh, scene as well. Uh, protagonists, uh, other objects of desire are coming nearer. So Sebastian would like to meet his long-lost sister again, and more, more obviously to the audience, because the main character is Viola. Viola is yearning to see her, her brother again, and she hears the name Sebastian, and that, that, uh, that suggests that he's still alive. So that's a teasing of a happy resolution that's foreshadowing of what's actually going to happen it creates suspense and tension and most importantly it creates in the audience anticipation of a satisfying ending okay finally let's get to the text Olivia is nervously awaiting the arrival of her, of her love interest, and Mariah announces that Malvolio looks kind of strange. He's acting kind of weird. He's acting like a madman. And Olivia says, the first important quote, which is actually quite important, he says, I am as mad as he, if sad and merriness equal be. 
So that, that's, that's a clear statement of one of the dominant themes in the entire play, which is the dual nature of love, love as a call to life and a destroyer. She's, Olivia is sad because Viola doesn't love her, but she's not giving up that sadness. She's enjoying that sadness. She's happy in that sadness. So what does that make her? That makes her probably as crazy as, uh, as Malvolio is purported to be. Now, I also want to point out this. This happens quite a few times in this scene. It, it's a comic scene. It's, it's a very, very comic scene. And yet there's a lot of seriousness that happens in here that is revealed in here. Uh, and, and we see it in the rhyming couplets. Now, Shakespeare, uh, when he wants to elevate uh, um, um, an emotional moment or a significant moment or an intellectual moment, uh, he, he, ends his, his, uh, he ends the lines in rhyming. He uses rhyming couplets he ends he uses end rhyme and and that elevates the speech and it re, it often reveals not always now be careful but it often reveals a something that you should pay attention to a theme statement and uh, and that's true in this scene especially okay so that that's that's one of the grand themes of this play it's the dual nature of love love as both feeling love art all of those lovely high things can both sustain our lives and destroy us and that's exactly what's going to happen in this scene it's what's happening to her she's being destroyed and sustained by the love by the unrequited love she feels for uh, uh, Viola uh, there's also the appearance versus reality reality theme here we see what we want to see delusion as madness madness as delusion she wants to she's she remember I just told you before she won't give up she she meets she meets a uh, 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 Viola and Viola says clearly no you sp you're supposed to love Orsino I can't love you and she just refuses to listen so that's a kind of madness as well she sees what she wants to see okay that's the first great quote so Malvolio enters and he thinks that Olivia is in love with him of course and it's the great cross gartered yellow stocking scene it's absolutely hilarious again go back and watch one of the versions I can't walk through through all of this it's just too much and I would ruin it for you. So it's just hilarious to watch. So go back and watch all that. However, right at the very end, this is really interesting. Um, um, she, now, Olivia has every right to think that Malvolio, you know, is, is, is guilty of, of sexual harassment, perhaps, or at least in a very, very inappropriate behavior, at the very least mad. But she says, so she, but she's not angry. She's more concerned than she is angry. She, she, she says, where's my cousin Toby? Let some of my people have a special care of Malvolio. Please take care of him. I would not have him miscarry for the half of my dowry. I would not have him come to harm for the half of my dowry. Now, it's again, it's one of these little throwaway lines that doesn't seem to mean very much. But all you got to do is pause in it for a few moments. And you, you see what Shakespeare's saying. In contrast to all of the ugliness we see in Sir Toby, in Mariah, even, which is who, wh what I'm arguing is that she's not much better than Toby. We, in contrast to that, those low characters, Fabian, too, is a creep. We see behavior like this. So here we see the noble Olivia, noble, hero-worthy. There's compassion here that contrasts sharply with the cruelty and absolute lack of compassion for uh, of, of Toby and Mariah. There's nobility versus baseness theme and the hero's journey wasteland theme, I am arguing. Go back and watch my theme video when I talk about how important it is in this play that we have a hero. There are the heroic characters and the, and the, the wasteland characters. The wasteland being a, a place of corruption and cruelty and deception and time wasting, that's the wasteland, and the noble characters, the, one that come, the ones that come along and heal that wasteland. Um, that's the it's the grand old, it's one of the grand old themes of a lot of Shakespeare stuff. Okay, so lovely quote that, and then Malvolio is alone for his ridiculous soliloquy. This little soliloquy is more or less a reminder to the audience of the contents of the letter, and it, it just it just ratchets up the humor uh, and the dramatic irony. So he's reading the letter, and he's saying this concurs directly with what what was in the letter. She sends for Sir Toby on purpose so that I may abuse him, which is what Mariah had written in the letter. So he's waiting now for Toby to come in and he's going to treat Sir Toby with contempt, which he pretty much did all the time anyway, I suppose. Uh, this, this, this next little quote is basically the same thing. And when she went away now, let this fellow be looked to. That's what, that's what Olivia says uh, as she exits. She says, let this fellow be looked to. You know, somebody take care of Malvolio. Fellow, not Malvolio, nor after my degree, my station, my position. But she called me fellow. So you see what's happening here. He's reading into the letter what he wants to see in it. And that's one of the grand old themes, again, of appearance versus reality. We see what we want to see. So go back and have a look at my theme video and 
go back and have a look at my character video. There's Malvolio, the self-deceived narcissist. Okay, we do. We project into things. We see what we want to see in the world. And that's what Shakespeare's saying. And he says that in a lot of different plays, by the way, not just here. Okay, so appearance versus, re versus reality. We see what we want to see. The dual nature of love. His love for Olivia has, has, has he right now he's on cloud nine. It's a call to life for this guy. He thinks he's heading off to a, to a whole new world. And of course, it's going to destroy him. His own self-love, the dual nature of love, the, the, the dual nature of self-love as well is what's destroying him, him as well because it's his narcissism. Uh, manipulation, of course, this is cruelty as well. We always have to remember as much as, as much as we love this takedown, we love to see this guy being humiliated, we have to think about what's behind it. Cruel, cruel manipulation. And at the very end, uh, that manipulation and the cruelty of it uh, becomes very, very apparent. We are the agents of our own destruction. His own blindness, his own narcissism, that's what's destroying. Is that what's destroying him? Or is are the devil's Toby and Mariah, what's destroying him? Well, there's an essay for you right there. So again, of course, Malvolio, the narcissist and the self-deceived. Poor guy. Mariah, Sir Toby, Belch and Fabian enter and the bear baiting proceeds. As I've mentioned, this is the hilarious scene where they're making fun of him. Uh, and it's, yeah, I'll get, go back and watch it. It's really, really funny. Uh, at the very, very end, though, I think this is the best quote of the whole thing. He says, he says, go, go hang yourselves all. You are idle, shallow things. I am not of your element. Now, the first few times that I read this, I just think that, yeah, okay, there's, there's, there's evidence that he's just a jerk. You know, you are not even in my sphere, you know, the element being the sky. You are, I am in the sky, and you are these groundlings. Uh, if you keep looking at it, though, you see Shakespeare playing his Shakespearean tricks. You are idle and shallow things. That's it. That's exactly what they are. They're shallow, idle things. Things. They're horrible people. They're wasting their lives. The Puritan isn't wrong. <laughs> Is he right? No, because he's wasting his life in another way too. It's, it's, it's absolutely brilliant the way Shakespeare reveals for us the, all of the complexities of, of what it means to be human. So here's appearance versus reality. We see what we want to see. He wants to see himself in this, in this noble position and everybody else is these mere earthlings, these mere mortals. Uh, the dual nature of love, his self-love is destroying him at the same time as it's giving him wings, do you see? Love is destroying him. We are the agents of our own destruction. We've already looked at that. Mavolio, the narcissist, self-deceived. Now this is interesting too. I'm gonna to point this out. He's, they are mocking him, pretending that he's possessed by the devil. They're joking around, of course, but in a sense, they are possessed by the devil. Toby, in previous scenes, I've pointed this out, Toby comments on Mariah as a little devil, you know, a brilliant, cunning little devil. That's what she is. And in several other instances throughout the play, the devil motif, the sat satanic motif is, is repeated. Now, Shakespeare doesn't do that by accident. Go back and watch my, uh, my uh, Macbeth video and I show you how the motifs, the manhood motif, the blood motif, it just, it's just the whole play is peppered with them. And that's what he's doing here, I think. I really do think so. Uh, and I think in a real, real sense, he is indeed possessed by the devil. If we read the devil as a personification of all of the, the cruelty coming from Mariah and Toby, the deception, that's, that's the work of, let's call it the devil, for lack of a better name for it, DC. And the other devil being himself, that, that is a vice too. That is a deadly sin, the, the sin of self-love. His narcissism is, is the devil as well. So in a very, very real sense, he's actually possessed by Satan. Absolutely brilliant. Malvolio exits. And Sir Toby says, uh, yeah, we've got a, we've, I've got a plan. We'll, we'll, we'll tie him up in a dark room. That'll be that for him. That'll be the culmination of our revenges. Uh, Sir Andrew then enters, and he's brandishing the letter, as we've seen. And they, the, all three of them, they read through the letter, and it's absolutely hilarious. There's not too much to talk about this, except we can make a connection to the hero's, uh, the hero's quest, the worthy hero versus the unworthy hero here. Now, there's lots of evidence here that his writing is just ridiculous. It reveals a... a, a, a a simpleton, a real simpleton. Uh, fare thee well. He's writing a challenge of, you know, to, to to defend his honor. He's writing a challenge to Viola Sebastian. Fare thee well, and God have mercy upon one of our souls. He may have mercy upon mine, but my hope is better. And so look to thyself, thy friend, as thou usest him, and thy sworn enemy. So it's absolutely incoherent. It's all over the place. It's 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 the it's the the outpourings of a simpleton. And so what we see here is, is again, Sir Andrew, uh, the buffoon, a lack of intelligence and eloquence. It contrasts sharply with Viola's eloquence and intelligence. 
the hero, the worthy versus the unworthy hero. Now again, go back and watch my theme video. I have argued that Viola is the worthy hero and her eloquence is part of that. Her eloquence is part of what makes Orsino fall in love with her actually. So yeah, it, it's actually quite significant. And again, Shakespeare, a lot of art works by contrasts and we see that here. On top of it just being hilarious. We love to laugh at a simpleton, don't we? What does that say about us? Have we got Satan in us, says Shakespeare? Okay, so uh, Sir Andrew leaves and, uh, and Sir Toby says, I I'll, I'll tear up this letter and I'll write a new one and then we'll have some real fun uh, when the two combatants confront each other. And then we have this really weird little love scene. Alone with Viola, Olivia says that she's embarrassed of her, of her recent confessions and she says, there's something in me that reproves my fault. So I'm, I'm embarrassed that, I, that I've put myself out there, made myself vulnerable, made, maybe made a fool of myself. But, she says, I apologize, but I don't apologize. But such a headstrong, potent fault it is. It's stubborn in me. This love thing is stubborn in me that it but mocks reproof. It's like, yeah, go ahead. You, you can be embarrassed of it, but you're not, I'm not going away. My love, love is me, and I'm staying with you, and I'm going to destroy you if that's what I have to do. So again, some, some really great theme elements being uh, revealed here. Love is both a call to life. It has awoken the poor, you know, girl woman, the, not the man child, the girl woman, uh, Olivia, has been awoken by love. And so that's how important it is. Uh, she, however, it could be the destroyer as well, the echo powerless to resist the attraction. So go back, watch my theme video. We talk about how echo wastes away in love for Narcissus as he wastes away for love, out of love for himself. So there you go, love the destroyer. Uh, uh, we can also talk about uh, our theme 10, the change, the metamorphosis. This is part of her metamorphosis. She's, she's accepting the fact that she's in love and she's accepting the fact that she's powerless in the face of it. Uh, uh, she can't do anything about it and fair enough, she's just going forward. So brave, fair enough. She's, at least she's engaged with the world, which she wasn't at the beginning of the play. Nobody was, they were all wastelanders. We are the agents of our own destruction. Our loves can destroy us as much as they can give us life. This next little quote supports what we've just been talking about. Uh, Viola is trying to uh, turn Olivia's attention back to Orsino. Olivia doesn't hear, hear her at all. She sees what she wants to see, hears what she wants to hear, and she says, here, take this jewel, wear this, please don't refuse it, uh, and come back tomorrow. Well, come again tomorrow, fare thee well. A fiend like thee might bear my soul to hell. Now, again, that's that's basically just her giving in to love, giving in to that call to life. At the same time, that call to life is actually destroying her. So that's what we've just talked about. Echo, powerless to resist the attraction. However, there's the el added element of the fiend here. Again, this is what I'm talking about with the motifs. It comes again and again and again. So we've, how many fiends do we have now? How many Satans? We've got Toby. We've got Mariah. We've got Malvolio for his self-love. We've got, are the time wasters Satan? satanic i think that's too far is love satanic well as the destroyer as the trickster all cultures have a trickster god just do some googling for trickster gods they're really really interesting and satan is one of those trickster gods maybe he's the king of the trickster gods anyway love is love a satanic trickster god that seems to be what shakespeare's saying and that's certainly what he's saying in a midsummer night's dream so there's something to think about Okay, so the hilarity continues or actually ratchets up with this crazy scene. So as I've mentioned, all of this dialogue up here is the back and forth. It's really, really, really funny. It's, it's Toby trying to convince Andrew that Viola is, is, a, is a fierce warrior and is bound on revenge and then vice versa over here. And so they're both terrified of each other and yet they're being forced to confront each other with blades. So it's hilarious. Now in the midst of all this, uh, there, there's one significant quote here that I think we should be talking about. Uh, he, in an aside, Sir Toby says... Uh, Oh, sorry. When Sir Andrew says, uh, when Sir Andrew capitulates and says, look, I don't want to fight him. I don't want to fight him. He, I, I'll give him my horse if you'll just, you know, drop the matter. So there's, there's, there's a symbol of his cowardice, his supreme cowardice. As soon as he finds out that his opponent has a little bit of backbone, he, he offers to give him his prize horse, uh, uh, um, you know, in, in order to escape a beating. Now, Sir Toby is laughing on the inside of this, and then as he's walking across the stage to talk to the other opponent, he says to himself, he says, Mary, I'll ride your horse as well as I ride you. Do you see the nastiness in that? Do you hear it? It's really, really evil. There's the nobility versus baseness theme. There's the horse as a symbol of the cowardice and deceit and the manipulation and that baseness, do you see? 
Sir Andrew is a horse, is a toy, is a plaything, is an animal, is a beast in the eyes of Sir Toby. That's how satanic Sir Toby is. And I don't think that satanic reference is, is in a mistake on Shakespeare's part. That Sir Toby as a psychopath, a sociopath, what is a sociopath if not supreme evil? Someone Iago-like from Othello wants nothing more than to hurt people. That's it. That's satanic. If that's not satanic, I don't know what is. In a symbolic way, not, not in a religious way, but in a symbolic way, certainly. Man, it's awful. Appearance versus reality, of course. So Toby is taking this guy for a ride, literally here, right? Manipulation, psychopathic manipulation. And here's some, we can also throw in here avoidance as well. The Peter Pan is hiding from life and self-hate and shallow pleasures. Here's Sir Toby trying to forget how miserable he is. And we've talked about that in previous videos as well. How miserable he is by just having fun in these, in these shallow pleasures. So odious, odious guy. Okay, so the back and forth continues. The drawing of the swords happens. Uh, it's, it's maximally hilarious. And then Antonio comes in to spoil all the fun uh, and says, put up your sword, okay? I'm going to defend uh, my friend Sebastian, who is really Viola in this case. Okay, now we get to the uh, Chekhov's gun. Antonio, as I've mentioned at the beginning of the video, uh, he, has, he gets arrested and he needs money to pay for his uh, uh, supplies and stuff in jail, I'm assuming. Uh, and then he asks, of course, his friend Sebastian, okay, I, dude, I, need, I, I gave you the purse, but I'm going to need it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm having, I'm having a, a bad time. Uh, and of course, Viola's like, what money, sir? She has no idea what's going on. So this is all of the, the dramatic irony that's really, really, really funny. But she says, well, I, don't, I have no idea who you are. You're this stranger who burst on the stage and asked for money. Uh, I see you're having a hard time. Uh, uh, here's half my coffer. Would you do that to a total stranger? Would you give half of your wallet to someone you, not, you don't even know? So what's important here is, is that it reveals uh, the heroic nature of Viola, as I've just mentioned. Um, she, she, she is worthy. She is, uh, it, it echoes Sebastian's sincere, sincere display of gratitude at, early on in the play when, uh, when Antonio first gave the, the purse to Sebastian. We see the same kind of honor being, uh, being replicated here. So nobility versus baseness, the purse as a symbol of trust, of honor, of nobility versus the symbol of the horse, which is the exact opposite. Again, there's the, 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 the motif of the wasteland, nobility, trust, honesty. honesty. Honor are the, those heroic qualities as, as manifest in characters must heal that wasteland. And that's what we see is happening here. And we, we, we love her for it. We see her on stage and we're really, really rooting for her. Um, and this quote really, really caps it off. She says, uh, so, so, of course, rightly, Antonio says, will you deny me? How, how, how dare you? What kind of friend are you? What kind of person are you? What kind of, what kind of honor do you have? And Viola protests and she says, look, I hate ingratitude more, than, more in a man than lying, vainness, babbling, drunkenness. Who does that remind you of? Or any taint of vice whose strong corruption inhabits our frail blood. There's the human condition, okay? So there's a clear statement of the worthy hero. There's Viola as the one that is going to heal the wasteland. Appearance versus reality, deception. She's, she's not involved in deception at all. And, she's the, and, and through that honesty, the, the wasteland shall be healed. Uh, the audience is gratified that not all people are corrupt. I really think we are. As much as we really enjoy watching the Mariah, Toby, uh, Sir Andrew stuff, I think there's, there's a bit of a shame and a guilt that we feel when we're watching, when we're taking pleasure in the torture of another human being. We are, and you did, and I do. So that's us as guilty, flawed human beings, you see, in our frail blood. As much as we love that, uh, we, we, we love to see, we need to see these heroes. Uh, in opera, the heroes are the tenors, and the tenors come on stage, and, and they, they set everything aright. Uh, so there it is again, the hero's journey, the wasteland, nobility, trust, honor, uh, honesty must heal that wasteland. Okay, and so there's another quote here that's related to that. Antonio pauses all of the action. Again, there's all this chaos, and, and Antonio's being taken away, and he's trying to get the money from Viola, but she doesn't have it. And so there's all this confusion. But he takes a moment to, to basically recite a poem. He says, In nature there's no blemish but the mind. None can be called deformed but the unkind, which means the unkind and the unnatural. Virtue is beauty, but the beauteous evil are empty trunks unflourished by the devil, overflourished by the devil. So the, the significance of this, as I pointed out earlier in this video, the, the rhyming couplets 
are a signal that we should slow down and pay attention. There's an elevated speech here, so are we in theme territory here? And indeed we are. Uh, it's, and it comes from that image of the purse, you see. That's that uh, Chekhov's gun that has gone off in this scene, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's allowing Shakespeare to drive home um, uh, his theme. Uh, here's again the devil. This, this, well, let me walk you through this. So in nature, there's no blemish but the mind. It, nature is nature. This, that's not corrupt. It's the human mind that's corrupt. And that's what we've just been talking about. We are the ones that, wake, that make the wasteland. And there's no deformity except for those who are not nice, who are, who are ungenerous, like Sir Toby and Mariah. And that, and that is unnatural. Uh, and then we get the association of the unnatural, of that cruelty uh, with, with lies, with someone who on the outside, like Sir Toby, looks like a friend to Andrew, but in fact is, is, is a devil inside, do you see? Uh, it, it's, it's, it's quite profound, it's quite important, and I think this is the core of this play, nobility versus baseness. We see Antonio clearly a high character, clearly a noble character who we cheer on together with the other noble characters, the heroes trying their best to heal that wasteland, and of course the, the evil, the satanic evil of the deception. Yeah, cool. Now, how do ignoble people respond to nobility when they see it? They want to tear it down. So when Antonio goes off stage, Sir Toby cynically says to his fool knight, his horse, his donkey, his ass, Sir Andrew, he says, come, we'll whisper or a couplet or two of most sage saws, of most poetic uh, musings. So he, he's, 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 he's heard Antonio's speech, and Antonio's speech was a strong rebuke to himself. Now to avoid that, avoid understanding that, what, what does that creepy person do? They, they, they mock it, and by mocking it, they try to extinguish its power. Do you see what I'm saying? So Toby here, mocking his better, Antonio is clearly his better, clearly, and he's mocking it in order to try to, to, uh, to reduce the impact that it has on Sir Toby's conscience, which I do believe it has. So here's Sir Toby, bitter, resentful, cynical, base, unworthy, wastelander. He's a devil like Mariah. I, I think, I, I don't know if Mar I don't, Mariah doesn't seem as bad as that. Mariah would recognize the nobility in Antonio, I think, if she were in this scene. Not this guy. This guy is the satanic figure. And, and what's Mariah then? What is Mariah? Find out, find out. It's really, really interesting. Appearance versus reality. We see what we want to see. He doesn't want to see goodness. He doesn't want to see goodness in anybody, so he mocks it and says, goodness is just foolishness. It's something, these couplets, this silly poetry, this, these sage, wise sayings and proverbs that this guy is spewing is nothing but, but, but trite garbage. Do you see that? Avoidance. Tearing down your betters is much, much easier than making yourself better. Do you see? Isn't that interesting? Now, that's Shakespeare's statement. I really, really do believe it is. And that's the end of Five Quote Shakespeare, Twelfth Night, Act 3. Don't forget to like and subscribe and pick up a copy of your PDFs. Thanks for watching.